Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director of Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And I am joined today by my fellow analyst, brilliant engineer, member of the Cube Collective community, Joe Peterson. And today we are so excited to have, you know, kind of, you know, an internet luminary with us, um, Bob Carper. Bob holds a CISM and a CISSP certification, actually two certifications, and he has expertise in pretty much everything as it relates to cybersecurity, but cyber risk management, policy, threat intelligence, analytics, you name it. I think, honestly, when it comes to cybersecurity, I think there's not much that Bob hasn't touched. So trying to list all of that is an onerous task. Bob, welcome. We're so glad to have hey, you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Shelley. Absolutely. Well, I will tell you, I stalk your content shared on LinkedIn and on Twitter incessantly. I always learn so much from you. So we're, we're just thrilled to have you. So today we're going to talk about a topic that we don't talk about all that often, and it's super important. We're going to talk about SMBs and cyber risk management and how small business organizations can kind of up their games when it comes to mm-hmm. Uh, you know, understanding the importance of mitigating risk, um, mitigating risk, developing cybersecurity policies and training their teams. And, you know, really, I think all of this flows from really having education and having a security focused culture. So um, I'm super excited about this conversation. And before we get started, though, Bob, my favorite question for you regular viewers and listeners, you know this, but my favorite question to get started with is I just love it when our guests share a little bit about their background and career journey. I know that, you know, I know the basics. I know that you started working in the financial industry and and that you were impressively employee number one, hired to start dedicated security monitoring mm-hmm. and incident response for Verizon Wireless. That's no small job, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I oh, mean, yeah. inc- and this, to, to, to you know, emphasize that, this included the infrastructure and the wireless customer network for over 150 million customers across the U.S. So if you were a Verizon, cust- you know, Bar- Verizon Wireless customer at some point, Bob had your back. So, Bob, talk to us a little bit. Tell us your backstory. Sure. Uh, well, like many people in this industry, I was a career changer. Um, I started out uh, doing commercial real estate and managing properties. Wow. At the at the peak, I managed in the 1990s over two billion dollars of properties, which today would translate probably eight to ten billion dollars worth of properties. Uh, of course. You know, the amount of tenants and that sort of thing was not anywhere close to over 100 million tenants, but there, but there were definitely thousands of tenants that I had to deal with. And it was uh, yeah, at least three to four layers of management that I dealt with. And, uh, you know, operations, uh, marketing, financials, the entire bit. But I got really tired of the boom and bust of the real estate industry. <laughs> and I decided to go back to school. I, I just said, you know, this, I'm at the end of the road. There's, uh, I can't go anymore. I, I got to turn around <laughs> and start and do another fork. So I went back and got a master's in information systems, started learning everything from scratch, you know, including Unix and of course Windows and gradually over the years, a little bit of Linux, that sort of thing. Hey, but, wait, I want, I want to ask you, ahead, please. Me, how old were you, Bob, when you made this shift? Oh boy, <laughs> you really got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I asked this because I, I'm I mean, probably. This... I, well, I, I asked this because I'm probably at least your age, if not older. And and part of what I want to emphasize here yeah. is that you know career shifts don't only happen to people sure. who are in their twenties or their thirties. Sure. So I'm curious. Exactly. Just give me a it was, I, I went to grad school at forty years old. Yeah, I was awesome. the, I was the second oldest grad sco- student in my class. But isn't it amazing how much how much more you get out of yeah. your education when you oh, come into it? <laughs> oh, oh, sure, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And it was quite quite interesting. And luckily, I came from some pretty good public schools back in the day, and yeah. I went head to head with people, you know, international students from all over the world. So uh, yeah. anyway, I was able to hang in there. Some of the other people had to drop out, and get a vanilla MBA. I could have got an MBA for, I think, two more classes, but I thought, you know, 
I have enough business classes already. Why, right. why do I need to relive that? So anyway, I started working for Fidelity Investments, did a lot of work for them. A lot of it was network management and uh, management of all the devices in the network uh, yeah. for world for a worldwide network. But then I had some opportunities come up. They said, oh, you know, this was back in the late 90s and then uh, later, early 2000s. And there wasn't that many people dedicated to uh, cybersecurity back then. If you were an IT guy, you were probably also doing some security. Right. And there was one project that came up, and it was like a key management center that managed all the the uh, encryption keys for basically there's you know millions of dollars, maybe even billion dollars before it was all over transfer between financial institutions, and they had it over private line, and they had encryption keys. And back then. It was probably AES 256 because sure. back back in 1999, that was DOD certified. It was all, you know, it couldn't be broken by normal computers back then. But anyway, that, that was there, I'm sure, for many years after I left. But then I also did things like forwarded uh, some of the first intrusion detection alerts to a, uh, actually, it's sort of a knock console, but we had it leveraged off or, or partitioned off for security events only. So this was long before they had any uh, Sims like Splunk right. or the Arc sites or, you know, you name it. Uh, but we did that sort of thing. And then, you know, network access controls, all, all that sort of thing. And I just kept on uh, raising my hand every time they had a project. Hey, somebody want to do this? Somebody want to... And so I kept on doing it, doing it. And, and then finally, I got to the point... Um, there was a position open at Verizon Wireless, and they had mainly dealt with contractors before and a few part-time people, but more like firewall people and that sort of thing. And so uh, they ended up hiring me, and it, we started from there. And, uh, of course, as employee number one, they uh, didn't give me very many employees at the beginning, expected me the earth. They wanted the earth, the moon, and the stars. And I said, you realize how many employees this is going to take? They, they didn't really want to hear it at that time. But I know that the group that I used to be over is grown uh, leaps and bounds since I've left. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm sure that you eventually got that team, even though it might have taken a little while, right? Yeah, yeah. So now now I'm doing more um I get to say ad advisory type of things, although I do some uh, threat hunting and also I do some uh, risk management too. And not, not in the traditional risk management like some people where, okay, let's fill out the entire NIST CSF or PCI or you know ISO or whatever. But I go and find holes, holes mm -hmm. that people don't realize that there's a big hole there and they're, they're just not seeing it yet. Yeah. And so I said, hey, wait a minute, guys, <laughs> this is not covered. Yeah, we need to do something. So uh, then I, you know, usually put together a group of people and we figure out how to take care of it from there. Also, yeah, so, no, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, also, I had I had the opportunity uh, for a while. We we did have one of the largest botnet monitoring networks in North America, if not the world, at one time, but definitely larger than any other ISP in North America. So that was pretty interesting to be able to see that. Uh, I huge amount, even though we're wireless network, a lot of people, you know, have their PCs on hotspots or their to, to, their, to their phone and that sort of thing. So definitely a huge amount of PC botnets. And then uh, I saw a, a, a Mac botnet ramp up from almost zero to like thousands, <laughs> like within like 24 to 48 hours. Oh, so man. anyway, saw some really interesting things when, when we had that possibility. So it's amazing when you have visibility, how much you can oh, learn. Oh, right? yes. It's crazy. Visibility. Yeah, I love that word, visibility. Visibility it, 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 and context. It, it, absolutely. We had uh, we did some research a couple of years ago that I, I mentioned on a regular basis, but <clears throat> it was um, we surveyed. CIOs and probably CISOs as well. It's been a few mm -hmm. years, so I'm pulling this out of my memory bank. Sure. But one of the questions that we asked was, um, 
do you have, do you use some kind of a dashboard that provides visibility into mm -hmm. all of your IT operations? And as you might imagine, some yeah. people did and some people sure. didn't. Right. And, um, and then we asked a question, um, about, you know, um, how many breaches happened or has, you know, how, has your system been breached in the last six months or something like that? Anyway, it was it was easy to make a direct correlation between the people who said, no, we have not experienced any breaches mm -hmm. and who had no visibility. Mm, with sure. the people. I mean, when you can see it, it's like watching the botnet thing. I mean, you can right. see it happening. Oh, it's sure. Oh, but exactly. if you don't have visibility, you don't know. So yeah. it's yeah. Just, and to add another one of my favorite pieces of research. Yeah, I was just going to say, sorry to add another layer in there. What happens is they have multiple systems that they're yeah. logging into. And so correlation becomes an issue, right? Mm, because they're sure. not able to they're oh, not yeah. able to correlate system A with system B. Sure. Right? So they've got so many logins, it's it's not one pane of glass. Right. Which you know, I think that is, vendors are trying to address right now. Sure. I, I, I completely agree. One of the one of the early things that I requested uh, when I took a, that position at, at Verizon Wireless was to be able to get uh, packet capture. Yeah, and because I had come from a network management and also performance management that sort of thing, I, I saw the traffic going across and how how well you know there was uh, at one time. Uh, Fidelity Investments had 10% of, of the New York Stock Exchange. And you could actually see the traffic ramp up as soon as the stock market opened. And, right. you know, you'd have to make sure that all your your pipes were, could handle the traffic. Yeah. And and if you saw some sort of, uh, you know, backlog or something, you, you needed to, to do something, you know, relatively quick to make sure you didn't lose any customers because of that. So I, I, that that visibility and context has been a, as a big thing for me for for the longest time. Yeah. But what was inter what's interesting too is I came up with the whole concept because I've actually done this and used this combination of packet captures and being able to have good visibility on the endpoint. And I came up yeah. with the concept of XDR like a decade ago, <laughs> and I actually gave it away to to some big vendors, and. A lot of times, some of them set on it. Two, oh, wow. There, there were two startups that happened because they were frustrated with their management because they weren't doing anything with it. And mm -hmm. I said, this is what I want. I want <laughs> this concept yeah. implemented. I will try it out on our network if, if you can actually make it happen. Well, the, the big company set on it, but then there was two there were several spinoffs and now, you know, everybody and their brother's trying to do XDR now. Right. <laughs> How well they're doing, that's maybe a wholly yeah. different story right now, unfortunately. But that's I a did different that. that's a different topic for a different one. Yeah. Yes. But I did <laughs> but I did that on a manual basis yeah. back then. Oh wow. Where, where I would look at the I would look at the, I would see the anomalies in the flows and mm -hmm. I would then I'd dig down into the endpoints and go, what the heck's going on here? And a lot of times I would see stuff and I, then I would just hand it off to our forensics team and just say, and they say, oh yeah, here, Bob found something again, you know, <laughs> it's like, he just never lets us not do anything. Yeah, exactly. But anyway. All right. Well, we're going to see, I knew, I knew the backstory would be interesting and thank you so much for indulging me. Sure. So we're, we're going to start, we're going to start talking about SMBs. Okay. And oh, as yeah. I said, you know, a lot, I feel like a lot of the conversation, both at a vendor level and an analyst level, I mean, a lot of times we're focusing on enterprises and, you know, and big companies and, you know, the reality of it is there's a lot of SMBs out there and they range in size from very small to not quite so small. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, there's some cybersecurity cyber stats I think our audience might be surprised by. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest factors involved in cyber attacks on small to medium businesses is comprised passwords. And the cost mm -hmm. of each attack is estimated to be about $384,000 and some change. Mm -hmm. According to some figures from the Ponemon Institute, 55% of their survey respondents in a, on password per pack practices, I can say this, they did a survey on password practices and 55% of respondents said their companies don't have, or they're not committed to a policy mm. on passwords and biometrics. Okay. 
Uh, Big Warden reported that 53% of IT pros, this made me a little twitchy, 53% of IT pros use email to share passwords with colleagues, and an alarming 44% of employees say they use the same login credentials across both personal and work-related mm -hmm. accounts. Again, this is like, you know, not we're not mm -hmm. <laughs> breaking news here, but right. just like thinking about sure. this is crazy you know and and people use their pets names their spouse and partner names their children's names 60 percent of u.s adults use birthdays or names in passwords you know think about the you know this is why social engineering is so popular um Organizations of differing sizes are affected in different ways by cyber attacks. Those with fewer than 500 employees saw about a 13.4% increase in average losses resulting from data breaches. Um, slightly bigger companies, companies with 500 to 1,000 employees, saw an increase of average losses at about 21%. So you went from 13.4 to 21.4%. And those with 1,001 to 5,000 employees saw a rise of close to 20%. So that middle ground is mm -hmm. uh, pretty risky. Anyway, um, and, and the bottom line in all of this is, you know, when we talk about cost per data breach um, and we think about, you know, who pays for that, the short answer is customers pay for that. 57% um, of organizations in the um in the Ponemon study said that they increased the price of their products and services as a result of the data breach, showing that again, you know, we lose all the way around. Our data is compromised and we get it to pay for it. So yay, um, not cool. Yeah, uh, totally. <laughs> so Bob, yes. our first question centers on cyber risk. I've set the stage for mm -hmm. you. We know what's happening out there in the SMB world and a lot of it is not good. Um, but this is why cyber risk management is so important. Tell us why what cyber risk management is. Sure. Well, in, in a simplified form, it's, it's finding out uh, where you have holes in your protection of your network and your endpoints and your data and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't uh, I don't recommend usually a lot of the small businesses to get into the you know a, a NIST CSF uh, you know because those are very expensive to, to be able to do those type of things. But right. uh, for example, one of, one of the things I do suggest a lot of small to medium size to look at the 18 controls, the CIS 18 controls. It's it's you know it's easily um, you know, it's easy to understand for most people, you know, with just a, a little bit of time, people can, you know, go over that and, uh, you know, have some understanding of what needs to be done. For example, you know, what, what are your assets? You know, what, what do you have on your network? Do, do you have a good way to, to find out what those are? And is there, is, are there any surprises there? The thing is, is the uh, software. I mean, uh, I can give uh, some good examples of some software that shouldn't be there. Uh, I, I've i ran into one time where somebody had their home security system, which was made in China, and they had software and they put it on their phone, They put it, but they put it on a company laptop. And all of a sudden there was bi-directional traffic to and from China. Uh. And, it, and so I said, hey, uh, that's not gonna, this, that cannot be on a company laptop. You, you put it on your own, uh, systems at home or phone or whatever, as long as it's totally separate from our networks, you can't do that. But the other thing I've seen occasionally, and I think it's finally with all the user education type programs that have happened, where some people would let their kids use a company laptop and they would play games mm -hmm. and they would get compromised. So, I mean, that's just some examples, you know, where if there's no controls, no policies, uh to be able to sort of limit that sort of thing uh you know uh anyway uh, it can get out of control real quick you know and i think that this is i mean i've had clients in this space forever um this is so much about education mm -hmm. and you know that person who put their home security system on their laptop they weren't doing it in any way you know with malfeasance in mind and they probably wanted to be able to, you know, open mm -hmm. and log on and look and see what was going on, right? I mean, yeah. so so it's it's 
And I think so many times companies treat education about around cyber risk as sort of a, okay, well, we did this, you know, we hired Bob and Joe and they both went through our mandatory training on the first week that they started you know, and you're mm -hmm. done. Right. Right. And, and that's yeah. not, that's not how you do it. That's not sure. how you keep people up to speed. And, and it, I think it's talking about things like this, like, if you have children who are gamers, if you have a home security system, if you mm -hmm. have like, and having those conversations on a regular basis and even talking about passwords and the importance of sure. you know, all that sort of thing. But, but human beings, we don't just know this, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the three of us know it, sure. but I think so much of this really hinges on education. And so I think that that part of the the keys to me of the important you know yes understand the importance of a risk management plan do all your homework do all your auditing and all of that sort of thing um but then really understand where you go from there and part of that sure. is on education you Abs know? Ab absolutely and i think you know uh, alluding to what you were talking about uh it's good if somebody does have some sort of assessment because most of the time these people don't know they don't understand right. where they might be vulnerable um for mm -hmm. example you know uh, there was a veterinarian clinic that i knew about and they probably just bought whatever was convenient at the local uh, best buy or something or maybe even who knows walmart and got whatever the cheapest antivirus software was and they thought oh well we're good to go well, they kept on getting hit with ransomware every single month, and mm -hmm. it was very expensive every month that they kept on having to pay f the same ransomware people, and they had the same <laughs> endpoint security. <What? laughs> and a after after several months of this happening, finally they reached out to somebody that had some idea of what what they needed to be doing in security, and they got a, a much a more advanced software or endpoint security suite. And then all of a sudden, the the ransomware guys uh, weren't able to to uh, take out their systems anymore. But he had spent <laughs> quite a few thousand dollars in the meantime before he got to this point. So uh, yeah. just what what crazy one of one of many things like that. But there's a lot of things people can do, and uh, some of them are simple. I mean. Um, I recommend people, especially if, you know, because there's a lot of small, real small businesses and like homes, just reboot your router at least once a week. If you, if you have a, a you know, a simple, relatively simple router, sometimes some of them can be programmed to auto reboot like two, three, four in the morning, and then it does it for you. And you don't even have to think about that. I would um, guess most people do not do that, Bob. Yeah, yeah, the vast majority. And there are the groups that I've that I sort of run in and out of from time to time. I keep on reminding them, did you reboot your router this week? <laughs> you know? And and it's interesting because I remember before the, the war in Ukraine happened, the Russians were getting into a lot of the Ukrainian routers and it was it was memory only uh malware that, that got in there. So uh, I knew some people in Ukraine. I said, "You tell all your friends. This is you need to start rebooting your router every single day. Yeah, to kick, kick this malware out. And and over ninety percent of the time, they were able to kick the malware out uh, just with a simple reboot on a regular uh, basis. You know what? I don't reboot mine enough, so mm -hmm. I've walked away already. This has been valuable for me. You know, I think the other thing, Bob, that mm -hmm. I me at, at Bob and Joe is that um, I think that you need to not be afraid." To push back. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm in the process of getting uh, my insurance agent is shopping for some new uh, homeowners and, and auto insurance. Mm -hmm. And um, he sent me an email on Friday asking for my date of birth, my social security, my driver's mm -hmm. license. <laughs> and I messaged him back and said, Dave, I would never transmit that information by email. I'll call you. Right. With, right. You know? One of my clients, hey, can you send me your tax mm -hmm. information? You know, I want to, I mean, it's like, but, or bankers who ask me to send information. I mean, people who should right. know better right. are routinely asking us for, and, and, you know, and it's funny because my husband was involved in this conversation going back and forth with the agent. And he's like, you know, you're kind of being a pain in the neck about this. And I'm like, okay, here's the thing. <laughs> I mm -hmm. spend all day, every day immersed in this topic. Mm -hmm. 
Like, you sure. know, so I know that it's easy to send information this way, but when somebody asks you to do that, you mm -hmm. need to stand up and push back. And, and even sure. if people think you're a pain or a dork or whatever, um, don't send your personal information by text message, by email. Don't do it. Sure. Absolutely. No doubt. One of the, the other things, of course, here's some, the simple basic things. Keep your operating system updated. One thing that I don't think people have, uh, a lot of people outside of the security community, they don't realize browsers are updating every single week now. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a big gap too. Not only the right. rebooting of the routers, but update those browsers every single week. Another thing I think that uh, it's not quite soaked in yet is that it, there is a lot of malware that goes over advertising and uh, the tracking yeah. that, that yeah. goes on right now. And I'm, I'm recommending people uh, very simple. I mean, I have much more sophisticated even my home home network, but I'm using uh, uBlock Origin and Privacy mm -hmm. Badger uh, simply because there are occasionally there's some websites that are news websites that require the advertising to happen so you can read the advertising or read the article right. um and you can you can take it off temporarily to read the article and then put it back on as soon as you read the article now i go a little bit further i have <laughs> i have layer seven firewall top of the line commercial firewall and uh dns security uh, yeah. also so i have like <laughs> three or four layers <laughs> but, awesome. but but anyway uh but but I just sort of look at it like, well, well, you know, if I really have to read that, I mean, if I really wanted to read that article, I, I figure, oh, well, I guess I could go to a phone or something, you know, and, where I don't have that necessarily in place. But, uh, but DNS, for a lot of small businesses, they can able, they could enable certain types of DNS services that do have blocking. I, I have a service. I won't mention the name because, uh, but anyway, it, uh, I mean, it, you can choose malware domains to be blocked, botnet domains to be blocked, phishing domains to be blocked, tracking domains to be blocked, even, even, even like the Roku tracking, which is if, if you haven't, well, if you don't have the visibility, like some people have, like I do, uh, Roku is like tens of thousands of, of DNS queries a day because oh. of the traffic going back to and uh, to and from. They're they're really uh, a snooper brigade, uh, <laughs> letting the uh, headquarters know what you're doing on your Roku. Uh, but anyway, uh, DNS and and for you know there are some for small businesses. You know, it, quite often it could be free or very inexpensive, and it does quite a blocking. I know. Well, one of the ones that I early ones that I did was Open DNS, and later was uh, bought out by Cisco, I think, in this umbrella now. But I had I found out some others that even have uh, even deeper lists too. Very cool. I think that uh, I don't use that. In I fact, probably should. In fact, I I do that for our customers too. Yeah, excellent. Five excellent. five five hundred thousand domains. Yeah. <laughs> No small number. Yeah. I mean, it took a while to get it tuned. So, you know, because because every once in a while, somebody would, you know, they would complain, small business would complain. And it's like, well, you are a C2 for for a, a APT group <laughs> right now. You need to clean clean your website up. And then we'll, we'll take you off the list. But anyway. So much to think about. Well, yes. I think now I, I think we want to talk a little bit about cyber risk scores. Sure. Joe, Absolutely. I think you had a question you wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Um, Bob, what is a cyber risk score and why does it matter? And how would somebody go about calculating? Sure. There, there are a lot of different ways you can get cyber risk scores. And once we, uh, earlier we were talking about NIST C CSF, but quite often those are done by uh, you know, the big four uh, firms and, and a lot, lot of other lot major firms, but it, it can cost easily tens of thousands, if not more, depending on the size of the organization. So uh, for many people, something that sophisticated might not be appropriate because the cost and the amount of uh, manpower, that, or woman power in this case, that, that would be needed to be able to uh, do those type of assessments. There are some lesser, uh, less expensive 
groups that do this too. And I think I think the key idea here, and I mean, if you want to mention some of the those, uh, you're welcome to. I I try to avoid recommending particular vendors unless you know uh, somebody is like you know pulling it out of me. But uh, I think the main thing I think the main thing is you need to know where your risk is. Where where are holes in your risk management plan? And usually there's multiple cat categories. This like. We talked about the 18 controls. There's 18 category, basic categories and there's subcategories under that. And you find out where your risk is. Like Shelly had mentioned earlier, it might be the passwords. Right. It might be user education. You know, are you yeah. doing it more than once a year or just once? <laughs> and that's it, <laughs> call it quits. You know, uh, I recommend small businesses if they can uh, have password if, if if they have more than one or two systems, if they got a, a dozen systems they need to log into, get get a password management. You know, they could buy them in bulk, bulk for some, some providers uh, to make passwords that are somewhat sophisticated. I I'm of the also on as far as passwords go, I'm the I'm from the notion of trying not to use words that are in the disc dictionary. Yep. Some some people will say, oh, just make it really long. Yeah, but then there's there's password cracking dictionaries that a lot of these uh, cyber criminals and nation states use, and they look for all these keywords. And and if, if you're in the U.S., they'll use a dictionary that's a U.S. dictionary and try to use that to speed up the process of cracking the password. Well, and but then you've got, you've got AI in the mix, and that'll yeah. make this uh, easier. Oh, exactly. continue to Making, make this easier. Yes, and, and making mince speak. Well, yeah, AI is doing a lot more than that. AI is... As you probably know, AI is making much more sophisticated uh, phishing emails. Yeah, uh, it's getting to the point. Even the top tier email security providers are being fooled because they're using generative AI yep. to develop specifically to get around the controls they got in place, which is which is scary because. The, if you, you before, if you had the top two or three email security providers, you were doing pretty well like a year or two mm -hmm. ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. getting to the point where they're the generative AI is finding holes for for the bad guys. Yeah, so, they are. and I I was just going to mention that <laughs> you know it is expensive to do a cyber risk score, but I've found some very yeah. inexpensive softwares online, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I guess. The way I think about it, especially at the yeah. SMB level, is even if you take 15 or 20 minutes and mm -hmm. do one of those self-assessment sort of, yeah, you know, Absolutely. it's pretty eye-opening, right? It's yeah. pretty, if you as one of the executives in an organization took 15 minutes of your time and just took one of those sort of, you know, right. quizzes, as it were, um, I bet you you'd be surprised at some of the questions that you don't have answers to. I yeah. completely right. agree. I it's completely just, agree. It's just that. Um, then the, the, another question that I wanted to ask you, Bob, is, and I see this a lot, and you must too, mm -hmm. sometimes in no, you know, no bad uh, juju here, but mm -hmm. sometimes companies have some very small budgets for security. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having a strategy, they'll buy a point solution and think mm -hmm. that they have everything covered. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really leaving their business pretty exposed to cyber risks. Yes. Right? I, so oh, completely. If you had to tell them for a company that has a really mm -hmm. small budget, one or two things that they should absolutely put in place and that you already shared a couple of great tips. Yeah. What would be, you know, like the, I agree totally with you that they, you know, the, the password yeah. um, I, protector, right? So sure. what else? I would, okay, let's go back to passwords real quick here. I, I'm recommending that people uh, do a minimum of 16 character passwords, upper, wow. lower, special characters, all, all of the above, minimum. That's not, yeah. not maximum, okay. minimum. <laughs> uh, it's it's crazy if they're not doing that, uh, and, they're not. Think, and really they should they should be enforcing it too. Figure out if there's a way if they can enfor enforce it. It depends on the systems, of course. Some systems right. have that capability, some do do not. Uh, you know, if they have anything assets exposed to the internet, boy, whew, 
they 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 might consider you know having it behind a layer seven firewall or some sort of you know sophisticated uh, security gateway or something, because if there's any vulnerabilities out there, the bad guys will nab it in in, in minutes. It's not. <laughs> it won't be a day or two down the road. Right. It'll be it'll be gone, and then next thing you know, your whole your whole business is uh, you know taken over. Um, the uh, uh, what I want to tell you again, we talked about operating systems, updating the browsers every right. single week. Uh, I, I do highly recommend small businesses to put the, at least those two uh, ad and privacy uh, blockers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I would shop a little bit for DNS that has the capability to block malware, phishing, botnets, all, all those. Um, where you I, host your website matters. Yes, absolutely. Where you Very, host your website yes. in case in yes. case that's in case that language yes. is something you don't and, understand. And, it's where you yeah. you know you don't just make this decision when you launch your company or redo your website or whatever. It's like who you sure. choose as a web host and, matters, and you want and, to pick somebody that has those. Sure, absolutely. The other oh, thing. Can I, can I add one? Can oh, I add please, one? please, please, uh, please. If you generate the bulk of your revenue from the internet, please, oh, please get a WAF, yeah. a web application yeah. firewall. Yeah, it's absolutely. different than a regular firewall. It's yeah. very different. So please get one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this this may be a little bit controversial, but I'm telling people don't don't do WordPress websites unless oh. you unless you have somebody that is an, a true expert, not just a wannabe or do it on the weekend. I had a WordPress website for probably a full year. I spent the first two or three months looking at all the attacks and figuring out how to make sure they were properly mitigated. That's yeah. the first two or three months of my spare time. Now, I did have a, a good WAF that one that I had paid for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was just the amount of effort it takes to properly maintain the security on a WordPress website is beyond the vast majority of small to medium-sized businesses unless they have somebody dedicated that can do that. I'm not talking about just one or two hours a month. I'm talking about one or two hours every single week, at least wow. minimum. Right. It's that it's that severe, and I've I've I saw attacks from all over the world, and I started and I started doing some geo uh, locking down of various yeah. locations in the world to help that, but I saw some nasty nasty attacks, and uh, I anyway I I won't say what I'm doing now. I haven't done as much as I should, but. Yeah. But the it's it's not WordPress, and they actually do all the back end management uh, uh, for you. Yeah. And so, but anyway, and and the just the uh, attack uh, plane uh, is just uh, it's it's far less. So anyway, yeah. uh, interesting. That's, that's good high... to know. I, I mean, I've used WordPress sites forever, and um, and I will say though that I've always made sure that again, I never, you know, to me, this is not set it and forget it. This is yeah, somebody's absolutely. job to manage and maintain the site sure. and to have a dashboard that shows them at all times what's happening across sure. all of the yeah. corporate sites uh, oh, sure. and so that they can get out in front of, a, you know, a DDoS attack or something yeah. like that. And um, so I think that it, and it is possible to have that you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i mean it is if, it's if... it's possible but i think i think the level of effort pe pe most the vast majority of people don't know the level of effort it actually takes absolutely to I agree. that level of security it's yeah simple as that and I, and i can tell you because of the experience i had before in talking to small business owners that had wordpress sites i mean they were used for all sorts of nefarious activity interesting uh, way beyond what they could even comprehend, unfortunately. Uh, good, but the good. 
cyber education. I think that's I think that's important. That it needs to happen more than once a year. I think it'd be nice if people even had uh, a little, a brief one minute thing once a week, maybe definitely once a month for sure. Yeah. Even if it's just a small thing. Remember, you know, your password should be this. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, just a little reminder that sort of thing. Um, you, you mean like a cat video, maybe? Yeah, cat video. Oh, yeah, cat videos would be, would be perfect. They would okay, well, we've been their... trying to figure out a way to monetize Joe's special yes. skill set as it relates to cat videos, and this yeah. could be. I mean, I can see this being shared. I think so. Um, and, and humor, humor can help. Uh, How yeah, can that you know, the other yeah. thing I think that's really helpful too. I love it. Um, when organizations kind of so it, a couple of different things one is you can yeah. do gamification and you sure. can test people's knowledge and then another thing that you can do i mean you can you can kind of launch internal campaigns even if you have mm -hmm. a company that has 10 people or 100 people or whatever mm -hmm. but you can launch internal campaigns that that identify where problem areas are and sure. so i i just feel like that yeah. kind of thing and something exercises so so if you know okay and maybe we don't tell people but maybe we do tell people this is the week where we're doing testing so make sure you have your acts sure. together or whatever yeah. um but i but i think having you know again it's about creating a culture of cyber awareness you know mm -hmm. and that doesn't just happen if you train somebody once a year when they mm -hmm. first start or yeah. once a year every year or whatever it really is i think is an ongoing initiative that can sure. be fun and interesting yeah exactly I think also um, uh, pr privilege access management oh, yeah. or, or admin, just having admin cr credentials. Yeah. People load all sorts of junk on company PCs all the time. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it. I mean, there was, uh, you know, even the, some of these coupon clipper things uh, have all sorts of nasty stuff behind them. Yeah. You know, unfortunately. And so... Uh, unfortunately, I don't think you, you can always just let people uh, yeah. get, get, you know, just download it and, and install whatever they need to do. Even, yeah. I mean, it happens even with admins that have 20 plus years of experience. I've seen them download stuff and it's like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> it's yeah. like, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. And the thing is, is they think they're downloading something, but they don't know what's coming along with that, you know? So, uh, matter of fact, I, I actually uh, started a program where uh, the what what was needed to be downloaded and installed on computers was only was available internally only and, and not externally. So, and then eventually we got to the point where we just eliminated admin rights altogether and you'd have to request very specifically. And then of course, you know, hopefully they're doing their due diligence on whatever it is they're uh, allowing uh, yeah. installed. But, but that's way bigger than a lot of people know. Small yeah. businesses should not let, let them have admin rights. It's just, you're, you're asking for it. All right, note taken. Yeah. The, one of the things that's coming up, uh, I think that's going to be interesting, um, and it's not, uh, it's probably starting to be there. I haven't found one that just stands out uh, above everybody else right now, is hardened browsers. Oh, yeah. Uh, this, you know, they started trying to do this, oh gosh, like 10 years, 10, 12 years ago. Yep. It's hot uh, again. And it's start, starting to happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't found one that just sort of knocked my socks off yet. Uh, a lot of the concerns, uh, if they go through, uh, they go, some of them just go through their own proxies uh, that's outside of the company, and then there's privacy issues and you're concerned about that. And so, uh, but I think there will be a time that the browsers, uh, hard, hardened browsers, and possibly even paid for browsers might be a thing. I know, they're, right? They're, that's exactly starting. Yeah, you're right, on, you're right on target. I was at a conference last week. Yeah, and it came up as a as a net new something sure. as sure. a depth. Yep. Yeah, and I've and I like I said, I've been following this for about ten years, and it sort of faded away for a while. 
I know they had they had a while they had a concept where they were just putting it in a big sandbox and then you sort of have uh almost like a reflection of what's in the sandbox to you know right. seeing what's there yeah. and so uh any malware wouldn't get on the endpoint itself but then there was you know latency and all sorts of other issues and that sort of seemed like it went away uh but it's starting again uh, sometimes it's just a um extension on a browser and other times it's a whole entire browser but, I think overhead is lessened in all that time. I, yeah. I agree with you. I remember yeah. when we started and overhead, mm -hmm. the, the layer of overhead has decreased. Yeah. You do it that and way. you get bigger, better uh, cl cloud, uh, you know, where, where, where the processes are, are uh, much more robust. Right. And, the, and the pipes going to and from. Uh, and the pipes are strong. That's another good point, right? Because yeah. latency is, is yeah. you know, plumbing. Exactly. Exactly. So. But, Anyway, uh, those All are right, some, so, some of the so, things. Well, I've got to, unfortunately, uh, the three of us could talk about this topic yeah. pretty much for days on end, I think. So as we wrap the show, Bob, I would love it if you would leave us with just your final thoughts on as our SMB listeners, uh, our SMB audience listeners are thinking about risk mitigation, cybersecurity risk mitigation, and are thinking about, okay, Bob says I need a cyber risk management plan, um, sure. you know, beyond, you know, starting with an audit and seeing what you've got, what, what are the key sure. steps that you recommend someone take to get started down this path? Okay. Uh, sure. I think a lot of these are ones we've already mentioned, but sure. Yeah. Uh, eliminate ad admin rights from the vast majority of users, if you can all do that. Uh, okay. Uh, Installing uh, installing things from the internet in general, you're you're just asking to to have your whole systems compromised. The other thing, one thing I wanted to bring up, and you, you you probably know this also, most businesses that have a major compromise are lucky to to uh, be around six months later. Oh, wow. uh, the ones that I have found out that have gone out of business, it's usually from the competitors that's still in business. And they said, oh, guess what? My competitor XYZ, had a data uh, breach. They, got, they got compromised last year and they never could quite recover. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's just- So this the, is uh, important. So it's very important. Uh, oh, one thing that I haven't brought up, uh, small businesses probably should have three backups mi minimum. If they can afford it, uh, look into immutable backups that, that uh, can't be compromised or you know, manipulated with malware. Um, I think DNS blocking is still overlooked. I, not just any old DNS, but specific DNS providers that do provide that service to block malware, botnets, phishing, all the badness that is out there in the universe. Again, uh, I block the advertising and tracking. You can always turn those things off temporarily if you absolutely have to, but uh, I would definitely just keep them on the vast majority of time. Don't don't buy just the cheapest antivirus or endpoint security software. I uh, recommend what well, AV test and AV comparatives. I think it's AV dash test AV comparatives dot org. Both of those have a dot org. Let, look at those and do a little bit of homework before you just lay your cash down on okay. your uh, endpoint security. Just not on any old inserts endpoint security. Um, have some training if you can. Uh, you know, there's, there's some free training out there. Have some training for your employees and yeah. see if you can do it more than just once a year. Anyway, awesome. that's some of the key things. Well, I think that those are important key things. And I knew this was going to be a fantastic conversation. You, of course, did not disappoint. Bob Carver, Joe Peterson, thanks so much for joining us on the Security Angle today. It is always a pleasure to swap gray matter with you two. And I look forward to doing it again soon. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Bob.